This is Ken Roberts inviting you to listen to another adventure of Casey, crime photographer. Ace cameraman who covers the crime news of a great city. Our adventure for tonight, The Upholsterer. Night, a gloomy street of small, grimy-looking shops, all of which are now closed and dark. In front of one of them... Goldblatt! Goldblatt! This is the Perucci. Is everything all right with you? Goldblatt! Hey, what are you doing, Perucci? Why are you trying to wake up old man Goldblatt? Is that to you, business? And what is a small boy like you, Joey, doing out so late? It's only half past ten. Anyway, the old lady ain't home from work yet. Joey, maybe you should go find for me a policeman. You want a cop? I think so. What for? Because, huh? Policeman is a cop. That's Carmody, the big flat foot. Officer Carmody! Officer! Yeah? Come here. Come here quick, please. Uh, something wrong, Ferrucci? Uh, I don't know. A couple of minutes ago, Officer Carmody... I hear what sounds like gunshots. Gunshots, huh? Gee. Where'd you hear them? I was just going to bed behind my shop next door. Suddenly, from the other side of my wall, from Goldblatt's place, I hear boom, boom. Then I hear what sounds like uh, something heavy falling to the floor. Door's locked tight. I call him. He don't answer. Hey, maybe the old guy shot himself, Carmody. Or maybe he's been murdered. Hey, kick the glass out of the door, Carmody. Pipe down, kid. Perucci, isn't there a window at the rear of Goldblatt's store in the room where he sleeps? See, si, but he's got iron bars on it, so nobody can get in. You'll have to kick the glass out, Carmody. I hate to uh, disappoint your destruction-loving little soul, kid, but I'm not going to do any expensive glass smashing. Then how are you going to get in? Well, there's a transom above the door here, just big enough for a runt like you to climb through. Me? Uh, uh, Goldblatt keeps that transom nailed shut, he told me. Well, uh, we'll see. I'll boost you up, kid, and you try it. Okay. Give me the lift. All right. Here you go. It's tight, all right. You can't move it a bit. Well, I guess we'll have to do some glass smashing. Well. But it'll be cheaper to bust that transom than the door. Here, take my nightstick, kid. You gonna let me smash it? I can't reach it, and you can for my shoulders. I'll bust it for good. That did it. All right, now I want you to climb through. But knock out all the glass so you won't get hurt. Now. All I want you to do is drop down and unlock the door. Hey, flash your lights to the door glass, Tommy, so there won't be in the dark. Okay. Uh, Joey, I see a big chair lying on its side just inside the door. Don't skin your legs on it when you drop. I'll keep an eye on that chair, Prucci. All set to go. May it swell. Now you have to move that chair out of the way so he can get at the locks. The door don't open. Hey, wait. There's three locks in the store. They only turn two. Okay, now. Okay, nothing. The door still don't open. Don't? You must have returned one of the two locks you'd already unlatched instead of getting the third one you missed. I'll get them all this time. Let go of the knob, Tommy. Let me open the door when I can. It's okay, but hurry. This guy Goldblatt would have to have his door triple locked. Ah, uh, Goldblatt is always afraid he's going to be robbed. I got it, Carmody. The door's open. Well, it's about time. Now I'll have a look behind that partition. Me too. I'll go to Blatt's workroom and back at that door. Uh, at least this partition door wasn't locked. Now, uh, here's a light switch. Now uh, we'll see. Well, I don't see anything look wrong. Neither do I. And I didn't expect to. You imagined those gunshots, Perucci. Hey, look here behind this busted sofa. What? Holy. It's a gold black. Officer Comedy, is he dead? Guy has two bullet holes through his chest. He's dead, all right. He's been murdered, just like the guys in the movies. Perucci, close the front door. The killer's still in this shop. He's not leaving. Lock that door. See, I lock him. Maybe the killer shook to me. No, he won't. I'm keeping my eyes open, my gun ready. Not many places here to hide. Yeah. Nobody under this bed, Comedy. No, nobody in this closet either. 
Hey, you duck under that bed and stay there, punk, if there's any shooting. I ain't afraid. Do as I tell you. Nobody back of this pile of furniture. Nobody hiding anywhere. The killer ain't here. I, uh, I locked the front door again. Okay, Perucci. Well, let me have a look at this rear window. Yeah, closed and locked from inside, and there's heavy bars on it, just like you said. Nobody could get through by that door in the front. Well, there's no other way into this place or out of it. And since nobody but us are here now, it's plain that poor old Goldblatt committed suicide. There's no gap beside him, Carmody. Oh, a gun probably fell under the sofa, kid. Here, I'll push it out of the way. No gun there, copper. Oh. Well, I see no gun any place. Neither do I. Must be under the body. I'll lift it up a little. Still no gap. No. No gap. Like I said in the first place, this job is murder. Yes, but if a killer got out that front door and locked it behind him before we busted in here, how could he have wedged that big chair back of the door after he was outside? And nobody could get out of that locked window in the back. Hey, this is a mystery, ain't it? Yes, and too deep a one for me. Well, thank the Lord I'm just a plain uniform cop. I'm using this phone to call the station house. Let him turn the detectives loose on this one. The homicide dicks weren't able to find any gun in that upholsterer's joint, huh, Casey? No, Ethelbert. They practically tore the place apart looking for one. So. When the medical examiner got there, he said Goldblatt couldn't have committed suicide anyway. Well, if the guy was murdered, how did the killer get out of the place? Well, Captain Logan and his men are having a sweet time trying to figure that. Yeah, they're going nuts, too. <laughs> Miss Williams and I just came from headquarters where we talked with Logan and also the kid and the shoemaker and the cop who found the body. They all tell a straight story? Well, it sounded straight to me, yeah. This has all the uh, earmarks of a very baffling mystery. You and Miss Williams ain't been to the scene of the crime yet, huh? No, we weren't working when it was reported last night. Mm, but we're assigned to it now. Let's go to the Goldblatt shop and have a look-see, Casey. Huh? Okay, Annie. Yeah, Logan said he'd be down there about now. <laughs> Maybe I can help the poor guy crack the case, huh? Mm, how you hate yourself. I... Why, Annie, how can anyone have anything but affection for a charming character like me? Hello, Captain. Hi, Logan. Oh, so you two are here. Mm hmm. So, this is the scene of the impossible Goldblatt murder. Wait till you size up the joint, wise guy. Oh, three good, solid locks on this door. And the door was locked tight by at least one of these locks when the cop and that kid and Perucci tried to get in. But skip the locks and answer this one. After the killer shot the old man and was making his getaway, how did he manage to leave a chair lying against the door inside? Which is the chair? Here, this big old high bag. Someone had left it here for Goldblatt to recover. Well, the kid and the cop and Perucci all agree this chair lay inside against the door, which opens inward. Yeah, on its side. They think it was about in this position. Now, it had to be placed this way by somebody inside. It couldn't have been so placed by anybody outside. Well, it may have fallen in that position after the door was closed. Miss Williams, a big solid chair like this doesn't just fall. It has to be wrestled around. Besides, the neighbors say Goldblatt always put a heavy piece of furniture against this door when he closed up for the night. The old guy had a constant fear of being robbed. Well, he was shot through the heart twice. Goldblatt couldn't have put the chair there after the killer left. I know. Uh, Dix from the uh, precinct station got here before your guys did last night. I suppose they moved a lot of stuff in the joint. Huh? Yeah, to make sure the killer wasn't hiding here. About the only thing they didn't shove around was this sewing machine because it was bolted to the floor. Hmm. Let me see where they found the body, Lloyd. Uh, come on. It was here in his workroom, behind that old sofa. Have you learned a possible motive for the murder, Captain Lloyd? No. Goldblatt had no enemies that anyone knows about. But he was so afraid of being robbed, a lot of people in this neighborhood figured he had a lot of dough stuck away here. So someone may have come here last night to get that dough, only they didn't get it and apparently never even looked for it. Yeah, we were told the precinct dicks found over a hundred bucks in Goldblatt's pocket and about four thousand hidden in his mattress. Mm, those are the first places a thief would look for money. Sure. Casey, see if you can figure it out. 
Huh? Me? Oh, I'm just a newspaper mug, pal. You're the big chief of the homicide department. Well, I'll soon be back at pavement pounding if I get many more cases like this and that Casimir killing. Haven't gotten anywhere with that either? No, but I got a chance there. Whoever bumped off Charles Casimir for the 80,000 bucks got some very hot money. That 80 grand was in $100 bills Casimir had just gotten to the bank, and the bank had made a list of the serial numbers which we've circulated all over the country. Now, when the murderer starts to pass that... Oh, well, wait a minute, though. He'll lay low for quite a while before he does that. He's even smart. And he'll try to pass him eventually, and we'll get him. I wish I had a string like that on Goldblatt's killer. Say, Casey, you're mm. a lucky guy, and sometimes you get hunches that don't turn out too badly. Huh? And now that you got the lowdown on this thing, you, you got any ideas? Well, now, uh, what are you paying for ideas these days, pal? You going commercial on me? Well, why not? When you're in a tight spot like this, a little first-class assistant from a qualified expert should be worth... Uh... Well, I'll tell you what. The next time a juicy murder is committed, you could let Ann and me in for an exclusive story and pictures. You know I never show that kind of favoritism. Uh, oh, okay. Well, maybe the little idea I have isn't worth it anyway. Uh, you got an idea? No, it's just a small one. It was really not worthy of my genius. Well, uh, nuts to you. Get out of here and let me think. <laughs> Come on, Annie. See you later, pal. I'm afraid so. Hey, Logan, all the uh, furniture in this workroom is stuff that Goldblatt had here for repairs. Naturally, huh? repairing and upholstering furniture was the guy's business. Ah, uh, I guess this is a chair he was getting ready to recover. What uh, else? The old cover has been taken off. Taken off neatly, too. Lying here on the floor. Cut carefully around the seams. It wasn't hacked. So what? Now, this overstuffed chair next to it with a shabby old cover still on. Look at that. There's a couple of big cuts in the back. They're away from the seams. As though it had been slashed. Uh, it's interesting. Ah, uh, I don't see why. Huh? Well, skip it then. Say... Casey... Uh, you still don't want to buy any ideas or hunches, pal. If you're serious, I never give reporters or photographers of one paper preference over those of another paper. Okay, tough guy. Well, I can't give a cop preference over my paper. So long, You pal. can go to... Uh, so long, Miss Williams. Well, I apologize for this mug, Captain Logan. Goodbye. <laughs> Logan's sore at me again, Ed. You have no right to rib him when he's in a spot like this. And I know you haven't even the germ of an idea that it might break this case. Annie, I not only have an idea now, but I've got a hunch. Casey! Wait a minute, let me write down something quick before I forget it. There we are. Okay. Huh? Come on, now, let's get in the car. We're going places. <laughs> Casey. Not very far, Annie. Oh, will you please tell me? Okay, okay. All right, now. Here's the idea that Logan wouldn't buy. Hmm. Giving it to him for free if he hadn't been so bullheaded. As it is, we'll prove it ourselves before he gets it. Well, what is the idea? Look, Goldblatt's neighbor, Perucci. He says that after he heard shots last night, he heard something heavy fall in Goldblatt's shop. Mm -hmm. And everybody, including myself, figured he heard Goldblatt fall. And apparently that's what Logan still figures. But, Annie, Goldblatt's body was found a good 20 feet away from Perucci's wall and directly behind a big overstuffed sofa. Now, Perucci didn't hear a body drop. He heard the crash of that heavy chair that fell behind that door as the killer ran out of the door and slammed it behind him. Well, Logan said that the chair couldn't have fallen, and I think he's right. It couldn't have fallen if it were resting solidly on its four legs, but suppose it was piled on top of another chair upside down. There isn't much floor space in Goldblatt's joint. He must have had to pile stuff up so he'd have room to work. Mm -hmm. And if that chair was piled on top of another, it might have toppled easily. And the vibration of a door slam would dislodge it. That's right. The precinct men had moved almost everything by the time that Logan arrived. But he didn't see furniture in piles, and he doesn't always use his imagination either. And the killer didn't waste precious time locking that door either. The Perucci and the policeman couldn't open because it. Because the chair fell between the door and that sewing machine that's bolted to the floor. It formed a, a solid wedge there until the kid moved it. Then, 
When he thought he was unlocking the door, he was really locking it. Okay, I'll buy that idea. All right. Now, where are we going? To an address I wrote down a minute ago. It was on a work tag attached to a chair in Goldblatt's workroom. Annie, we're going to find out why. There were several big knife cuts in the back of that chair. Yeah, there's the address, Annie. It's across the street there. Furnished room to let sign in the window. Yeah, rooming house. Mm -hmm. And it'll be the landlady who sent that chair to Goldblatt for recovery. Now, what's the full extent of your hunch about that chair, Casey? It tells me to get acquainted with the Mrs. Potter whose name was on it. And I hope that she'll give me some information. Now, look, Annie, you wait right here in the car. I will not. If there's information to get that may make news, I'm going to be where it's got. Annie, look, I'm not going to her as a newspaper guy. I'm going to let on I want to rent a room, see, and try to get her talking. Well, both of us can be renting a room. But together? I've heard such things have been done. We'll pose as husband and wife. Oh, well, that, 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 that's something that hasn't been done yet. By us. Well, it's being done now. Huh? For very impersonal reasons. Come on. Oh, uh, well, okay. <clears throat> Hope I can act like your husband. Oh, you'll never learn any younger. Maybe you'll never learn, period. What? Nothing. Well, you must have some sort of a plan, so you do the talking and I'll just stand by. Yeah, that'll be best. Okay, here goes the doorbell. You better begin to look wifely, huh? Don't worry about me. Hey, someone's coming. Now, remember, let me do the talking. Yeah, okay. Good afternoon. How do you, How do, you do? do? We're looking for a room and saw your sign. Oh, won't you and uh, your husband come in? <laughs> Thank you. I have a very nice supper room on this floor that's just been vacated. Do you mind the lower floor? Not Why? at all. Well, then come this way. Oh, uh, what's your name? Uh, Mr. Casey. And Mrs. Casey. Oh, it's a pleasure to know you. I'm Mrs. Potter. Well, it's nice to know you, Mrs. Potter. Yeah. Well, uh, now, uh, let's see the room. Hmm? One of my best. It was our back parlor when my husband was alive, but since I had to take in paying guests... Yes. Uh, do you like it, Casey? Uh, you call your husband by his last name, Mrs. Casey? Why, uh, why, uh, uh... <laughs> It's a habit she got into before we were married. Uh, yes. Yeah. Oh, it's a little unusual. Yes. Well, I have a most unusual wife, Mrs. Potter. Uh, <clears throat> the one thing, she lets me do all the talking while she just stands by. Hmm. I can see she's just a shy little thing. Hmm. Shy. Shut up. I suppose you try it. Well, this is a comfortable-looking armchair. New, Mrs. Potter, or is this... Uh... Reupholstered. Oh, reupholstered. And by that poor man who was murdered last night. What? Murdered? Oh, there's a big piece about it in the morning paper. A little old man named Goldblatt. Oh, why, we heard about that, Annie. Yes, we did hear about it, Kate, uh, darling. Huh? Oh, oh, they say it's quite a mystery, but it's given me a personal worry. I let him take one of my chairs to his shop only yesterday morning. What, yesterday morning? Yes. And now with policemen all over his place, heaven only knows when I'll be able to get it back and in what condition. Well, the cops take pretty good care of... Uh... Things like... Uh, I believe they do. I mm -hmm. hope you made note of the condition the chair was in when uh, Goldblatt took it to his shop yesterday morning. Well, I mean, were there any tears or cuts in it? Oh, no. It was just terribly shabby and needed new covering. But oh. my, my, my. Sending that chair out taught me something I'd never suspected. Oh, what was that, Mrs. Potter? Well, it's been in the room of one of my oldest lodgers, a gentleman who lived upstairs in the second floor flood for over five years. And I've always considered him one of the mildest men alive. That's right. Uh... But he flew into the most awful temper when he came home from work last night and found out that I'd sent that chair to the upholsterer. Oh, he... He, he did? Oh, but you're not interested in such gossip, of course. But, uh, Do you like this room? I usually get 20 a week for it, but, uh, well, by the month, I might make it a little cheaper. Oh, it's $20, huh? Well, uh, uh, <clears throat> have you any vacancies on oh, the second floor, Mrs. Potter? Yes, I, I have an empty across the hall from the gentleman I just mentioned. Oh, you, ha you have? Oh, but I doubt if you like it. I... Well, could we see it? Of course. This way. It's yep. a much smaller room than the one I just showed you. Oh, I won't mind that. Oh, but maybe Mrs. Casey will. Oh, no, no. <laughs> I'm easy to please. Uh, yes, mind it... the stairs there. They're a little steep. <laughs> the uh, gentleman who didn't want his chair recovered, is he in his room now? Mm, no, he's never in this early. He's at business every day till 6 o'clock. Oh. oh, but my, my, it's nearly that now. <laughs> <laughs> what, um... Uh... Business is he in? Oh, he's a bookkeeper. Oh. In the offices of the Charles Casimir Company. Charles Casimir. Casey. Poor Mr. Casimir was robbed and murdered only a short time ago. 
dear, dear, dear. There's so much crime these days. Well, here's the room. Oh, it's fine. It's swell. We'll take oh. it. We have more than looked into it. Oh, we've seen enough. Well, that's exactly what we want. What's the rent? Why, th- uh, $15 a week. Okay. Here, here we are. It's a week in advance. Oh, thank you. Oh, when you move in? Well, we're in now. But you haven't any baggage. Uh, well, I... It's outside in our car. We'll uh, bring it in later. Later? Uh, now, now I know you have a lot to do, Mrs. Potter. It's nearly dinner time, so why don't you run along downstairs and don't bother about us one little bit. See you later, Mrs. Potter. Oh, but yes. I... See you later, Mrs. Potter. Hmm, well, I... well, this is a little irregular, but you look like such nice young people. <laughs> Goodbye. Did you get it, Annie? Of course I got it. The man across the hall had something hidden in that chair, and when he learned it had been taken to an upholsterer, who'd tear it apart. He went to Goldblatt's. He slashed the back of that chair, took out what he'd hidden in it, and killed Goldblatt so he couldn't tell what he'd seen. And Mrs. Potter said that the man worked in Charles Casimir's office. Maybe it was the stolen money that was hidden in that chair. Yeah. Come on. The coast is clear. Yeah. We haven't much time. It's quarter of six. Well, Fifteen minutes is plenty if we work fast. Yeah. Oh, his door is locked. Naturally. These bevel spring locks have never kept me out of a place I wanted to get into. <laughs> well, when there's enough space between the door and the frame to put this little gadget I always carry. Yeah. Hey, that did it. Come on, quick, yeah. so I can close the door again. Now, now what do we do? Listen, Annie, if this guy killed Goldblatt last night in order to get back the money hidden in that chair, he's had to hide it again. Now, tend to when he's hidden it in here a second time. Yeah, so we search the place. Right. Well, Casey, maybe he's sewn it inside of something again. Yes, that's probable. Yep, look, here. There's a sewing kit on the dresser. Ah, it's a needle stuck in the lid. It's threaded with a piece of dark blue. Well, that means he was sewing on something blue. Yeah, there's nothing blue in the room. Well, we haven't looked in the clothes closet. Maybe there's something in there that's... Then I'll blue. open the door. And... <laughs> Don't scream, young woman. And if either of you moves, I shall... Well, this is... Quite a surprise. It was very fortunate that I came home earlier than my usual time today. Well, we wouldn't call it fortunate. Back over to that wall. What do you think you're going to do? There's only one thing I can do to protect myself. Kill you. I have a car parked outside and I can make my getaway. And there's something I'm taking along. My winter overcoat. Casey, it's dark blue. There are $80,000 in bills sewn in its lining. Charles Casimir loot. You are quite right. And now, goodbye. You're not going to shoot us? Casey! No, you don't. (gasps) Knocked his arm up just in time. Yeah, you've knocked him out. I see that he stays out, too. Annie, run Hmm? down and get my camera from the car, will you? We get exclusive pictures and a story without any deal from our pal, Logan. So this guy was the killer of Charles Casimir as well as the murder of that poor little Goldblatt fellow, huh, Casey? That's right, Ethelburn. The Casimir job was his first crime. See, he worked in Casimir's office and he learned about the $80,000 withdrawal that his boss was making. And he got a greedy impulse. He never had a chance to spend a nickel of the dough he did two murders for. Like I always say, to coin a phrase... Crime does not pay. That's right. Mm. Well, it pays Captain Logan. <laughs> He's been congratulated by the commissioner for solving the Goldblatt and Casimir job and told that he's now right in line for an inspectorship. How did Captain Logan get the credit? Oh, hey, he deserved it. Yeah, that guy's a swell cop. Just because a pair of newspaper stiffs like Miss Williams and I run into a little luck. Well... Our Mr. Casey, whom I sometimes like, Ethelbert. Call Logan in to make an exclusive arrest of the killer. Hmm. What do you and Casey get out of the deal? An exclusive story. Plus pictures. Casey got a bullet hole through the sleeve of his best coat when the killer shot at him. Well, I never liked that coat. And I? (laughs) I've got a blasted reputation with Mrs. Potter. She's found out that I'm not really Mrs. Casey. This is the United States Armed Forces Radio Service, the voice of information and education.